Sound check, one, two, three. Sound check, sound check, sound check, one, two, three.
Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Audit Finance Administration Committee for Thursday, June 1st, 2023. Happy Pride Month to everybody, and um, welcome to Councillor Tammy Huang in the chamber, Councillor Brad Clark, Councillor Mike Spedafora, Councillor Alex Wilson, and Councillor Maureen Wilson, and joining us virtually, Councillor Mark Tattison. I'd like to call the meeting to order. All electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function during committee meetings, and that includes um, any loud vibrations from your phone. So if you have a loudly vibrating phone, please also uh, make that stop. Um, I'm also on note right now that quorum is present. Before we get going, just want to check in with the clerk to see if there are any changes to the agenda. Uh, no, Chair Critch, there are no changes to the agenda. That's the first time that's ever happened, thank you. <laughs> um, may I please have a mover and seconder to approve the agenda as presented? Moved by Councillor Spadafora, seconded by Councillor Huang. Is there any discussion on today's agenda? Not seeing any, we will go to the vote. I see you, Councillor Tattison, thank you. And that vote carries seven to zero. We'll move on now to de declarations of interest. This is item three on the agenda. Are there any declarations of interest for items on today's agenda from members of the committee? Doing a scan, seeing nothing. Okay, we'll go on to the next item, which is the approval of minutes of the previous meeting. Item four, and we're approving May 18th, 2023. May I please have a mover and second or two approve the minutes of the May 18th meeting? I see Councillor Spadafora moving that. Somebody want to second that? Councillor Huang. Any questions about the minutes from our last meeting, which there for a moment seemed like they might be controversial? Um, anyone have any comments about them? Seeing no comments, we'll go to the vote. I see Councillor Tattison in the affirmative. And that carries. No controversy, 7-0. Sorry, just give me one second. Uh, uh, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Councillor Beatty has joined us. Uh, Councillor Beatty, did you want to vote in favor in, uh, on the um, on the minutes? Sorry. I would vote in the affirmative, and I apologize for my tardiness. That's okay. Welcome, Councillor Beatty. So that um, will be eight zero, I think. If yes, I will fix that. Okay, great. I didn't do it, and I will just briefly do it, let you know who's here in the chamber with us today in terms of staff representing folks. Um, GM Zagarek, Acting City Manager Jason Thorne, Director McMullen, Executive Director of Human Resources, Laura Fontana. I can't see everyone's name placard, so I apologize. I see uh, Director for Transit, Maureen Cosen Heath also. And Tammy, can you say the other person's name? I can't read it from here, sorry. I can't hear you very well. Manager Coca is also in, in chambers today. Thank you so much, appreciate it. We're on to consent items, item nine. And 9.1 is the Hamilton Women and Gender Equity Committee. No quorum notes from May 4th, 2023. May have a mover and seconder to receive the no quorum notes. Moved by Councillor Alex Wilson, seconded by Councillor Huang. Are there any questions on this item? Not seeing any, please indicate your vote now. I see Councillors Beattie and Tattison both in the affirmative. And that carries 8-0. Now we're going to move on to the rest of the consent items to be received, and we're going to do the remainder at once. Those are items 9.2 to 9.4. May I have a mover and seconder to put those items on the floor? Moved by Councillor Huang, seconded by Councillor Spadafora. Are there any questions on 9.2, Utility Billing Transition Program Update, FCS 21082E? I recognize Councillor Clark. Good morning, Mr. Chair. 
And so I'm trying to understand the cost implications for the city. Do we have a full target on that yet? Through, through the chair, Mike Segarek, general manager of finance corporate services. Uh, Councillor, the steering committee and the working team are still developing the associated costs. Uh, you'll see in the report that is consent item that is before committee today, uh, the timelines with respect to the various components of the work, including the procurement of uh, customer information systems, the uh, procurement of a customer portal, uh, the back office uh, systems that have to be in place, as well as printing. Um, when staff have a better sense in terms of the procurement and the bids associated, through those exercises, then we will have a sense as it relates to the, the associated costs. Just as a reminder for committee, uh, what will offset these associated costs is our contractual uh, or historical contractual relationship with Electra. Having said that, we do expect that there will be costs in excess of what the cost was. Uh, to as it relates to our contract obligation with Electra. So I do expect the cost of bringing this function in-house will exceed what we have historically uh, paid Electra for providing these same services. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I ask GM Zagarek if he recalls what those costs were with Electra? Through the chair, uh, we have senior policy advisor, John Savoya. He, I believe it's in the $6 million uh, range and I'll uh, invite uh, senior policy advisor, uh, John Savoya to uh, confirm that if, if he recalls. Uh, through the chair, yes, the 2023 budget for the electric contract is $6 million right now. So then the only increase to the levy would be um, if the RFPs come back higher than that six million? Through the chair, that would be correct. Uh, that will determine what our future operating costs will be, that in conjunction with the staffing that has to be uh, brought on. Uh, with respect to the, um, the capital, we do have uh, a capital project that was approved through the 2020 three rate budget um, for the cover of the cost of the implementation and and uh, both of the software solution and its related items as well as the consulting and staff that will be involved in the implementation phase that will occur over the next um, I guess 16 18 months. Thank you my last question chair if I may to I believe GM Zagarek would be I understand that we have an, a print shop in, in inside City Hall. Uh, many of the councillors use it. Is our internal print shop capable of printing and stuffing envelopes for those for that contract, or will we need to go outside? Through the chair, I would expect we would go outside, similar to our practice as it relates to tax billings. Uh, so we engage an external printer as it relates to our, our tax billings. But uh, I would just invite uh, John in case he's been party to any conversations uh, with our internal print staff as it relates to uh, the current stage of our work. So through the chair, uh, we've actually had, uh, I have been engaged with our city taxation group. Their um, contractual relationship with the, the vendor they have right now is actually coming towards an end. So we are looking to actually uh, bring their print needs in together with the future utility uh, bill print needs. So that way there we can uh, leverage um, greater efficiencies. And the cities of Markham and Vaughan have also expressed some interest in potentially participating as well. So we would expect that that would uh, bring us uh, s significant efficiencies. I would also note that when Horizon got merged in with the Electra, they went to an outside vendor, whereas previously they had done it internally. The costs associated with printing the type of volumes that you need and the equipment you need, it just 
I guess it's, it comes down to uh, more volume and it can be done uh, effectively with the outside vendors. So just to put it in perspective, um, we generate a, almost 2 million invoices a year for uh, utility bills and approximately 70% of them are still hard copy uh, with about a 30% um, bill, uh, e-print bill at this point. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank staff for, for those responses. I have been nervous, as many of us have, about the potential increases in costs. Uh, I think they're doing their very best to find the efficiencies that will keep those costs as low as possible. So thank you for that, and I look forward to the next update. Thank you. And there are no further speakers on the list for 9.2. Going to look quickly in case anyone wants to emerge as a speaker. Not seeing any. Thanks, Councillor Clark. We're on to 9.3 Parkland Dedication Reserve Report as of December 31st, 2022, FCS 23041. Are there any questions on this item? I see first Councillor Alex Wilson and then Councillor Tammy Huang. Thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor, just wondering if staff would be able to elaborate on the very last paragraph of the report that talks about the 60% allocation fee uh, change that came from the provincial government and how that practice of 60% allocation maybe changes from past norms or past practice with this fee, uh, with this reserve, rather. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, yeah, through the Chair, Brian McMullen, Director of Financial Planning, Administration and Policy and Corporate Services Department. Um, yeah, so that change uh, was required related to also the um, development charges and related to um, the Parkland Dedication Reserve with the changes. So they're requiring, uh, the province is requiring us to spend or uh, commit 60% of the funds um, through the, through the um, 2024 budget process. The past practice, um, that wasn't required. Um, we, were, we would spend the money and we report on it um, annually through these through these types of reports. Um, that wasn't the requirement in the past. The requirement when um, we spent the money, it would, would have been in a capital budget, put it forward and use um, the Parkland Dedication Reserve as one of the funding sources. And through the chair, maybe I'll just expand on that as it relates to meeting that obligation. Uh, our colleagues in growth and development and public works are developing the master plan as it relates to park. And through the master plan, we would be uh, we would fill, fulfill the expectations of demonstrating where the proceeds, uh, as it relates to this this reserve, would be dedicated as it relates to development and the development of parkland uh, as it relates to to the growth in the city. Thank you, and through you, Deputy Mayor, I really appreciate that clarity, understanding the process change at the province, now just seeking to better understand what that actually means for us, because now that we have this practice change and we are allocating these funds, it sounds like this wasn't practice to maybe allocate this much of the reserve in the past, or that's maybe, like, that's a bit I'm still a little curious on is what's the actual change between past years. But the point I guess I'm trying to build towards is when I read the eligibility criteria for the Parkland Dedication Reserve, I also heard, read other recreation investments or that kind of, there was a more breadth than just maybe a new park. We have parks in the city that don't have washrooms and we're talking about cooling centers. We are about to enter a city in like a summer where people don't have access to drinking water necessarily at every park in the city or across the city. I think a lot about the fact that we've heard a delegate at emergency community services talking about the state of repair of the Dundas pool and in conversations with staff, that's not currently in the rec master plan for replacement. We do, we have so much infrastructure in need of repair and replacement across our city. It's a huge equity burden, I think, across the city as well. And it hasn't been necessarily budgeted for in past budget, some of the replacement of some of this. Some of it is budgeted, but some of it's unbudgeted. Is it responsible to primarily use this fund and the 60% allocation for growth related, or is it more responsible as an organization to invest this in repair, refurbishment, in, in existing neighborhoods, some of those things, because we know when it comes to our parks and rec facilities, there's an infrastructure repair backlog that is soaring. 
so through the chair, going forward as, uh, as uh, described earlier, as a master plan is being developed, what we would look to do is to ensure that the application of any of the parkland dedication reserve meets the obligations of legislation. So if the legislation speaks to the proceeds being applied to the activity that generated the proceeds and that being development related, we would look to apply the proceeds towards development related uh, areas within the city or activities, either parkland or recreation. Not to suggest that it uh, cannot be applied within existing developed areas because there is some infilling or activity within existing. And so we, we experience from time to time particular projects that while uh, they're existing assets, there may be an expansion to that asset that is tied to growth. So there is a, the opportunity or potential subject to whether or not there is some growth or development uh, related activity. We've experienced some of the challenges with, with respect to parkland uh, and some of the limitations with respect to the parkland dedication reserve. Some years ago, we established a parkland acquisition reserve and we purposely incorporated in our capital plan contributions to the parkland acquisition reserve recognizing the limitations of the parkland dedication was precluding council from pr proceeding with some priority projects either parkland or recreation or a blend of those projects so while there are limitations with respect to the parkland dedication we have identified the need for additional funding and that is our parkland acquisition reserve so there is a reserve that was established uh, and included some additional contributions through our 2023 capital project. So a combination, uh, we have a combination of options. If there is a requirement that is appropriate with respect to the parkland dedication, we would leverage that. If it's not appropriate for the parkland dedication, we would turn to our parkland acquisition. And historically, because of various demands and limitations, We've employed a variety of tools. We've, we've done in the past, it's no longer available, but area rating, we've, uh, we've divested of assets and reinvested those assets. So in the past, we've looked at a variety of tools as it relates to these needs. Uh, through the chair, I was just going to add one other sort of um, uh, new wrinkle that has come out of some of the recent provincial legislative changes, which is that there is the ability for uh, developers to actually um, identify which lands they intend to dedicate to the municipality. Uh, and the municipality, if we deem those not to be the lands that we would want to take and refuse that, that is an appealable decision. Um, so there's a fair bit more authority with developers these days to actually be the ones to identify um, what those parkland um, and, and where it will be located. And, um, and we are starting to see some of that in some of the applications coming forward. So that's a new um, um, limitation in terms of municipalities' discretion. And, and through the chair, apologize for, those for the home, fragmented. Sorry. Yeah. That was uh, sorry. Acting City Manager and General Manager Planning and Economic Development, Jason Thorne. Yes, sorry about that. Just want to make sure everyone knows who's talking, that's all, thanks. And through the chair, apologize for the fragmented response, but a reminder, uh, follow up to a conversation of yesterday is under Bill 23, is that uh, there is some foregoing a parkland dedication uh, collections or fees to municipalities, and that will have to be addressed through future conversations with council as it relates to how to offset the, the proceeds that historically we would have realized through parkland dedication fees. Thank you. I think you've actually just hit on the, the nail on the head. And so if the province is not allowing us to fund growth related infrastructure through a cut to development charges in new developed areas, we cannot further take resources out of existing neighborhoods to subsidize those new parks in an attempt to make ourselves right over there. We cannot you know, borrow from Peter to pay Paul if that makes any sense. Um, and so this is, I think, the piece that I really want to follow up on. But what I heard in General Manager Thorne's answer is that we have fewer resources for new parkland fees coming in. But what I'm reading here is we have about a $90 million fund and we have to not spend, but allocate about 60% of that. So we're talking roughly $60 million needs to be allocated this year. I guess I'm, I'm trying to get a little bit of understanding from staff where is that $60 million going to go? Because when I hear growth-related infrastructure, 
I think about Gage Park. I think about Bayfront. I think about the Dundas Driving Park. I think about the Sam Lawrence Park on the mountain. These are city-wide assets that no matter where you live, people are visiting. I was at Gage Park last week. I was at Bayfront yesterday. I don't live in those neighborhoods, but they're part of our city's jewels. They're part of our city's treasures, and we need those city-wide parks as part of planning for growth as well. And so I guess I'm just getting a, I'm looking for some understanding on what can we do with this roughly? It's a little less than 60 million. What can we do with the roughly $60 million? What limitations exist on those funds that are there? And do staff have a sense of where that might be going right now? And what are the opportunities for council to provide direction? Through the chair, uh, it is that work that we are, uh, staff are currently developing in part as it relates to our development charge background study, the master plan, our park plan master plan. And it's through that park plan master plan that uh, we'll work with our colleagues in growth and development and public works to identify what the requirements needs are, uh, what the financial capacity, whether it's through the parkland dedication or other funding sources, and that work would then come forward to council. Just for clarity, the 60% is a commitment. And so municipalities would have to demonstrate through a multi-year budget how the municipality would be leveraging the reserve as it relates to those future projects. So does not necessarily have to be be spent in the in the current year or, or in 2024, uh, but the municipality has to have a plan in place as to how it is going to leverage up to 60% of that reserve as it relates to uh, relevant and related projects. And I guess I'm just, my, I've, I've heard maybe the parkland master, like the parkland master plan is the place. And so taking that, I guess my question is, is the recreation master plan not also the place? I'm reading from the section in this report and maybe when I go to the official, the official plan, there's more criteria that exists than what's just in the report in front of us. And I'm open to there being more exclusionary criteria, but there is language here that says, or other recreation related activities. And so that's where I think a lot about are rec centers that are at end of life cycle within the next five to 10 years that are currently unbudgeted for replacement. Um, that's not just an unique to Dundas. And so I think a lot about across the city, what that means um, as we enter into an era where we need to be doing infrastructure renewal um, and what are these funds for in that process. Through the chair, uh, it may be. Uh, I would say it will be subject to uh, what the needs are and the associated costs when the master plan, the parkland master plan is brought forward. If the reserve has sufficient capacity to address those parkland requirements is then we would turn to that reserve to see as it relates to the ancillary projects uh, within those areas, whether it's recreation or other. And so again, it's a bit of a combination of examining the various needs and the financing tools available to us and trying to marry the financing tools with the needs. So not to suggest it precludes the opportunity of applying the proceeds to recreation, but the challenge will be is whether or not there's sufficient funding for the needs that the Parkland Master Plan identifies in the coming years. Thank you, Chair. Those are my questions for right now. I really do appreciate the clarity and look forward to being part of that process as it unfolds. Thanks, Councillor Alex Wilson. Uh, next up on these speakers will be of Councillor Huang, followed by Councillor Clark, Councillor Beattie, and I've added myself to the list as well. Councillor Huang. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, not a lot, like similar to what Councillor Alex Wilson is asking, but I wanted to understand what is the potential refresh rate going to look like on this particular reserve. Um, I, again, this comes back to 60% needs to be spent. Uh, we have no more real dollars coming in. What is the essential runway of this particular reserve? Through you, Chair. Through the Chair, can I ask uh, for just to confirm my interpretation, is is the councillor asking in terms of the future proceeds, what are we projecting in terms of collections of yeah. parkland dedication? Yes, and I think at some point I want to understand how long do we have with this particular reserve or do we have to retire this reserve at some point because it just runs out of money? So through the chair, the, the last question is probably easiest. Is this reserve would continue in perpetuity? There's, there's no end date. Uh, 
with respect to this reserve. In terms of future collections and commitment, uh, I don't know that uh, through our reserve reports, uh, which I believe staff are finalizing and bringing forward, we do pro provide projections for the next three years. I don't have that before me, but through that reserve, we would provide some projections, I believe for the next three years or thereabouts. Glad to hear that it's not gonna run out of money. Um, so at this point, would you call the 71 or is it 88 million as the current balance? And uh, is that considered healthy or are we below projected amounts through you, Chair? Through the Chair, I'd be cautious to comment at this time in terms of whether it's healthy or sufficient. Mm -hmm. It really will be subject to, to the Parkland Master Plan. And when that plan comes forward and identifies the, the needs and the associated costs, that is the opportunity for us to assess whether this reserve is sufficient as it relates to those requirements or whether there is a delta or a gap as it relates to the costs relative to what we have collected as it relates to parkland dedication fees. Okay, last question then. Um, if we view today being the benchmark and we time it at time zero, um, how long would it, um, and we're mindful that we do have to spend 60% of the dollars, um, how long will it take us to get back to this particular point? Through the chair, uh, this reserve is not necessarily, I, I, I would describe, it's not a re revolving fund reserve. Uh, this reserve is intended to align to what the municipality's parkland needs, uh, principally as it relates to development and growth, and it is a funding source as it relates to those needs. So again, this is the significance of a parkland master plan is that provides us a sense as to what those requirements needs are, and then we would look at how to financially satisfy those requirements from the reserve, uh, likely from levy, because often there is some benefit to existing, uh, not all growth related. If it's beyond, if the reserve has sufficient funding that it is the ancillary cost, so not just the land or parkland, but as well as uh, some of the amenities, um, whether it's recreation or other amenities, we would look to this reserve in terms of satisfying find those needs. So again, the, the significance of the master plan is it identifies the capital investments, the needs, and then we would turn to our financing tools in terms of how to satisfy that. Okay. Thank you, those are all my questions, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Huang. Next up on the list is Councillor Clark, followed by Councillor Beatty, and then myself. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, so when I look at this particular issue, we have parks that exist, we have parks that have not been built, and we have parks that have been approved through growth management but may not have been built or may be in, in it. So this reserve, can I ask, uh, Chair, was it funded through growth development or is it a mix of funding sources? Through the Chair, it is funded through development-related activities, so parkland, uh, parkland development fees. The parkland acquisition reserve, this is why we have two separate reserves. The parkland acquisition reserve, which it can be applied for a broader variety of projects, that is funded through levy contributions from, from taxpayers. And so when we're talking about, uh, I'm gonna have to be parochial here, so, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Alfreda Growth District, for example, or development that is encroaching on that growth district, um, are we still permitted to charge developers who are planning on building in those areas a fee to assist us in the building of the parkland, or can we still ask the developer to build that parkland as a part of their development 
I'm a little bit confused on how new growth will continue to get new parks. Uh, so through the chair, yes, we can, um, and and as as we have in the past, where they can either uh, dedicate land or pay cash in lieu. Um, a couple of sort of the recent changes that that changed that a little bit is some of the caps put in in terms of how much land or cash uh, we can uh, require. And as I said earlier, um, there's also now a, a, an ability for the developer to kind of identify um, which lands within their property if they want to do a, a land dedication. Um, and where in the past the city could could just say no, that's not the the land that we would want, and 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 the city could be a bit more in the driving seat in terms of where those land dedications are. There is now an appeals mechanism built in so that a developer could uh, could appeal if the city deems the lands being proposed for dedication as being not suitable for our needs. Um, but other than those changes, the, the general principle still remains the same: um, that new development in a greenfield area would provide either land or cash in lieu. Uh, thank you for that. So on a go forward basis, are we planning on maintaining this dedicated parkland fund from growth perspectives, as well as the parkland acquisition reserve um, and increasing those reserves the best we can with each budget process? Yeah. Through the Chair, uh, we are looking to maintain the two reserves uh, and to continue to track the proceeds of the, those reserves separately as it relates to the proceeds that are related to parkland dedication fees versus the uh, proceeds as it relates to levy contribution or other funding sources that are directed to the acquisition reserve. That is our intention to continue past practice. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just a quick comment. I, <laughs> I have never been more grateful than I am now for our expert staff. With all of these complex changes to these bills, um, it, it's somehow comforting to have staff who actually are able to break those bills down and understand the implications to our city and help us to to minimize uh, the negative impacts uh, from these changes, especially with Bill 23 and those development charges. It's, it's been very uh, frustrating trying to understand where they're going and, and our staff are, have been m most capable in terms of that explaining to us what the heck is happening in Ontario. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Clark. Up next and now is Councillor Beatty, and then I'm after Councillor Beatty. Go ahead, Councillor Beatty. Thank you, Chair, and through you, I'm going to follow a similar line to Councillor Clark and be a little bit parochial, so I apologize in advance. Um, through you, Chair, the Stone Creek urban boundary expansion um, has been contemplated for the better part of 20 years. Councillor Clark, uh, having been around for the uh, original uh, planning and, and assisting I remember uh, with uh, probably Councillor uh, Brenda Johnson, Councillor Dave Mitchell, probably uh, going through the original foundation of this plan that is now just on the verge of coming to fruition. I would suggest that the uh, Stony Creek urban boundary expansion is probably when it starts to unfold will be the largest block of development that's going to take place in our city. Um, and it's, uh, as I said, nearing nearing the finish line after 20 years. I just want to understand through you, Chair, to staff, there are a number of parks identified under that plan as well as the Fruitland Winona Secondary Plan. I'm of the understanding that this is the fund that pays for current and future acquisitions of those parks. Through you, Chair? Through the Chair, that's correct. And um, from what I'm hearing, there's a robust uh, level through you, Chair, um, within the account. Um, so I, I'm anticipating that the remainder of the acquisitions, and again, I'm, I'm apologizing in advance for being entirely ward-centric, but I just want to have comfort in knowing that there's um, sufficient funds to complete that program um, because it's a kind of one and done. We'll, we'll get in. We're, we're going to do a whole lot of building in the area. want to make sure that the parks are adequate. Um, as anticipated under these plans and, and hopeful 
that the funding is uh, stable to continue um, in the direction that's been laid out over the last two decades. Through the chair, I would say again, that is what uh, we are awaiting in terms of the master plan to identify uh, those, those geographic areas that require investments as it relates to parkland ancillary costs, and then we would apply a matching principle. Those areas that have contributed, where there has been growth or development, we would look to apply reserve funds to those particular areas and look at the sufficiency of the reserve relative to the needs. Okay, that's um, the answer that I was looking for. Thank you so much, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Beattie. Yeah, Councillor Wang, if you could take the chair so I could, could uh, ask some questions and make some comments. And I think that uh, just, to, just to kind of borrow some language from Councillor Beattie, I think this is going to be uncomfortable, unfortunately, for all of us. I don't think there's any comfort to be found in this. And, um, you know, some of the future plans that are going to be coming forward in, in areas like Stony Creek, some of those developments will themselves, um, when those parkland dedication fees are assigned through the de development and application process, will probably, there'll probably be a relationship between those in the future. In terms of the reserve, my understanding, and based on the conversation today and reading here, is that you know we have we have to be mindful of the fact that developers have some input here, but in terms of the amounts that we already have collected, where that input um, wasn't a direct in a directed fashion, I want to talk about that. And what I'm reading here in the report is, and I'll read it out. The resulting changes to the Planning Act require that beginning in 2023 and each calendar year thereafter municipalities are required to spend or allocate at least 60% of the funds in the account at the beginning of the year, starting in 2023. But when I'm reading in the next sentences, the 60% allocation requirement will be addressed through the year and or through the 2024 tax capital budget process, process which is anticipated to be adopted prior to the end of 2023. Can someone resolve that tension for me and explain the difference between why we're being mandated legislatively to do this by the beginning, but that we're going to do it by the end? Through the chair. Through the chair, again, it, it, uh, the reason for that difference is comes back to the timing of the master plan, exclusive of having that master plan that identifies what the investment strategy is, it is difficult to, it's impossible to commit the funding to, to projects. And for that reason is the lag or delay is awaiting for the development of the parkland master plan. Thanks. Does that put us in any kind of awkward place in terms of the legislation that requires us to do? That's what I'm trying. I understand the impossibility we have here as a city to be able to do between November 28th and January 1st, come up with a plan to spend or allocate. But I just want to understand what our obligations are and, and what um, you know penalties might exist if we don't do it on time. Through the chair, I'm not aware of penalties. Uh, the, the spirit of the legislation is uh, for municipalities to demonstrate a need as it relates to these reserves. And I would say it is good practice in that there seems to be confusion in the broader community in part tied to Bill 23 as it relates to reserves and the purpose of reserve municipal reserves and a perception that municipalities are sitting on large pots of funds that are available for a variety of purposes. That is not the case. These funds were generated as it relates to specific activity intended to be invested in specific projects. So again, is I expect that when that master plan is, is prepared and presented, we will be able to demonstrate the reliance of this reserve as it relates to those particular projects. Thanks, and I'm not sure if these are questions, um, but I'm gonna get parochial too. Um, the place where the growth is happening a lot <laughs> is downtown, as evidenced when leaving the building. So I'm hoping that what we're gonna see here as part of the, the Parkland Master Plan is a real dedication to enhancing green spaces in places where there has been density in film development. And where I know specifically, and I can actually think of a few projects over the last five or six years where um, parkland fees, I thought to myself, great. Um, hopefully these are gonna go to the neighborhoods directly where they're, they're being impacted. 
Um, we have a really huge challenge downtown too because to make some of these parkland um, miracles arrive requires a ton of creativity. I can think of one example right now, and um, we're working through it with park staff in terms of a conversation is, hey, um, what do we do in Corktown South where we have Wolverton Park, this weird uh, fake green space that Google Maps calls St. Joseph's Park, which is not a real park, and then also this, this kind of rail corridor past a bunch of apartment buildings that's attached to another green space and an empty lot. How do we imagine those spaces connecting to one another? Behind City Hall, how do we imagine the space at St. Mark's connecting to a potential development in the parking lot that could provide green space? How do we bridge that with the central school green space? the public portion of that, right? How do we create these kinds of fabrics of green spaces, which I think are much more expensive projects than being like, ahoy, there's land, let's put a fence, right? Like that's, that's not gonna require us to, and I'm being obviously a little bit minimalistic in that, we're not just gonna put a fence around anything and call it a park, but I'm saying the imagination required is expensive. How are we dealing with that equity issue in this process? Because um, I'll say this, because I think it's important to say it out loud in Ward, Two, there are 38-ish thousand people according to the recent studies and, and 19,550 dwellings. Ward eight, uh, ward seven, you have 48,000 people and 18,000 dwellings. Just to give you a sense of how the density really works here. And so access to green space here is paramount inside the tiny postage stamp that's ward two. How are we, how are we ensuring that, that all those factors are, are um, brought to bear in the parkland dedication master, the parkland master plan? So through the chair, uh, I'll describe our past practices as it relates to some of these issues. The Parkland Dedication uh, Reserve has not been uh, leveraged exclusively in the sort of green belt areas. We've leveraged this reserve in part where there has been infill or intensification. Uh, does this reserve, would this reserve be appropriate to use uh, exclusively? Likely not because there would be some benefit to existing. So it, it would be part of the funding strategy. Where there are limitations in terms of this particular reserve is an, if an area is fully built out and staff identify a deficiency in parkland, that is the limitation of this reserve. Hence, we created the parkland acquisition reserve because we identified the deficiency in financial tools as it relates to, for instance, that scenario. A fully built out area, no intensification, no infill, barred it, but a deficiency in parkland. And hence, we have the two funding sources. We may, from time to time, leverage both funding sources. It's really subject to uh, the factors that are contributing to the need and how we match the funding tool to those factors. Thanks, I have two further questions. Uh, specifically when I think about um, expropriation and then when I think about school board land, so I'll start with school board land. Uh, I understand the school board is in charge of its own land, so the province is in charge of that land. Let's just, let's just leave that aside for the moment being. Uh, children um, being able to have places to play is a priority for every level of government, including the municipal government. And one of the challenges downtown, especially in the lower city in general, uh, is a, not an access to playable green space. Uh, we're seeing costs to maintain that green space are expensive, so schools are choosing things like a turf, um, which increase the heat impacts um, for children who are playing on that turf, as opposed to cooler grass and, and more places for trees. I think of a great example, there's a school on the mountain, I hope I get the name right, I think it's George Armstrong School. When I looked down the Google map to see how big the play space was there, I was astonished at the size of the school play space. It is unbelievably large, um, bigger than park, some parks in Ward 2, if I remember correctly. Um, and, and I can think of Hess Public School, I can think of um, certainly um, Queen Victoria um, and others where there's not adequate green space. What's our relationship um, with the parkland master plan um, and school properties? And is there a relationship between those and how we understand our obligation to ensure that there's, that there's any uh, space? Because school boards often can't uh, afford to do this, uh, can't afford to provide these services. And we can appeal to the government, and maybe that's a plan, as to appeal to the provincial government to provide more funding. But I wonder if there is any relationship there that we have. And you may just say, no, there's not one. And that's, that's just more information for me. Through the chair, uh, I'll... I'll we have re relied on these reserves as it relates to when school boards have deemed 
properties to be surplus properties for the purposes of acquisition. So we've turned to the parkland dedication, we've turned to parkland acquisition, historically no longer available to us. We've turned to area rating of parkland. We've again turned to, to divesting of city assets and applying those proceeds. So again, subject to the, the factors or circumstances, all of those have been tools we've leveraged in the past as it relates to school board properties that were deemed surplus. Follow-up question to that if it's okay. I know there's somebody else in the speakers this after me. Um, second time speaker. But I I wanted to ask a little bit of a complicated question. It's a, I know the answer, I think, but I think it's an important question to ask. Um, taxpayers uh, who are in the lower city, literally people who are paying into the taxes, I'm, I'm speaking about that specifically because we're talking about an assessment question, um, pay into area rated funds. And I know the council can approve any expenditure under area rated funds. Primarily what we're trying to do is spend that on a certain kind of infrastructure and the policies as we should, but there have been many, many, many exceptions to that and council can do what it wants with that money essentially. I'm asking that question because I think that um, there may be some justification for using some of those funds to supplement some of these types of types wow. of situations, right? And so I want to just ask really kind of bluntly about that and about whether you think that's an appropriate use of, of, of using some of those funds. Um, in Ward 2 right now, we have um, quite a reserve. Now, that's, there's a lot of needs in Ward 2, and so that's going to go to go to helping. But um, are there situations where you think it would be appropriate to use some of those funds where we don't have others and we've exhausted other things to uh, improve green space in, in Ward 2? Through the chair, the short answer is yes. In fact, when the policy was de developed, we identified that as a issue that was arising and we identified the fact that the area rated uh, reserve funds could be banked, recognizing the, the cost associated often with acquisition of lands. So we, at the time, we identified that as an issue. We identified area rating as an appropriate tool and we recognized that those proceeds may have to be banked for a number of years to provide sufficient funding to proceed with an acquisition. I just want to just plainly say there's a real tension there and a real a real difficulty in that, and I see uh, some of my colleagues agreeing that you know that's not really an equitable process. It doesn't really work. Doesn't make a lot of sense. But it's it's recognizing also it's a funding source uh, that exists. Not for everyone though. Uh, and so I want to be really clear about that and understand um, what that mechanism looks like. The last question I have is about expropriation. And so can parkland dedication fees be used to expropriate property in order to, to make more green space occur? The reason I ask is because I can think of a couple of examples right away where um, historically, and I'm talking like 30, 40, sometimes even 50 year conversations about parkland being expanded by, by expropriation. Um, haven't really materialized. And so I think, okay, well, there's two reasons for that. One, expropriation is complicated, and I won't ask you to explain that. Uh, two, it does cost money, and quite a lot of money to expropriate, and sometimes above the market threshold when you expropriate a property and purchase it. You know, that kind of stuff is important. So, but can these fees be used to expropriate property in order to expand green space? Through the chair, if, if expropriation is the mechanism the city is having to rely on and as it relates to satisfying a parkland need, then this reserve would be appropriate as it relates to those associated costs. Thanks. Um, I have no more questions. A final brief comment just to say that uh, I think this is a really, really important conversation. I think that we need to get it right in terms of what we use this money for. There's a ton of needs in terms of green space um, as our climate um, change emergency continues, we're going to continue to rely and need more spaces. And the sooner we get on developing spaces and planting trees, the faster the trees will grow and the, the, you know, the greater the urban forest canopy and other forest canopies around the city will be. And so I think that there's a lot of urgency around this, which I think I'm sensing from, from my colleagues here. And I hope that when we see this and have this conversation about the Parkland Master Plan, that level of urgency is applied to this um, and applied to, to doing that. And I will say, hey, um, <laughs> I agree with the provincial government in terms of um, their sense of applying urgency to this. That's the only thing I read from this that I, that I think is a benefit is that um, there's an urgency being applied to this process. Now, maybe the urgency isn't for the same reasons I feel that it should be urgent, um, but I'm grateful for the impetus regardless. Thanks. I'll take the chair back and next on the speakers list is Councillor Alex Wilson. 
Thank you. Um, I've heard a couple of times that we're gonna be allocating these funds through something called the Parkland Dedication Master Plan. Where is that plan? What is that plan? Just if public are listening, they wanna get engaged in that. What is the URL on the City of Hamilton website where they can see that and engage and be part of this conversation too? Um, Good morning, Maureen. Cousin Heath, Acting General Manager of Public Works for Carlisle Can. Um, I have reached out to my colleague in Forestry and Parks to get an answer to your question, and I'll provide it for you shortly. And through you, Chair, maybe a follow-up to that that might help get it faster is, it is this a new process? Like, are we changing the master planning process? And right now it's been in the recreation master plan, but we're maybe moving it to this thing called the Parks Master Plan because we've been consulting on a Parks Master Plan in 2022 on Engage Hamilton, we've done two phases. You can read a survey that summarizes the results, but there's not a pre-Parks Master Plan. And so that's gonna split those plans into a new thing. And one of them is gonna be a Parks Master Plan. That's my assumption that's what's happening. Um, but if that is what's happening, I think we should tell people that they're actually reading the Recreation Master Plan, if that's what they, that's the current document. So through the chair, I'll, I'll, I'll start, and, I, and, and I'm not sure I can answer the question about sort of the, the, the parks versus the recreation, but in terms of the master planning process, it's not a new process, um, and this is one of many master plans uh, that we develop uh, in advance of our development charges uh, update, uh, which is coming next in, in the summer of 2024. Um, so alongside our water wastewater master plan, our, um, our um, what we're going to call our active transportation master plan, which is pulling together kind of the trails pieces out of the rec master plan and the cycling pieces to create an active transportation master plan is the direction we're going. So yes, there's some subtle differences there in terms of how we're combining some of these initiatives, but the idea of having these master plans done um, typically every four or five years um, informs both the development charges background study and how we're collecting development charges, and then it also informs um, prioritization for, for other funding sources such as this one. Thank, oh yes, please. Through the chair, if I may. The master plan will be back in front of the Public Works Committee in September. Uh, public consultation has already happened and there is information on the Engage Hamilton platform for the community. Thank you. There is, so, okay, so this is, I, I won't speak definitively, but I would assume that if folks want to read the current allocation, they go to the rec master plan. If they want to read some of the consultation, they can go to the Engage Hamilton website. And it's called the parks master plan, not the parkland dedication master plan, just to be, so we're getting our terms right. That's what's on the Engage Hamilton website. And what it says is three quarters of respondents want more park washrooms. That of the 70 washrooms that we have, this was the biggest need that people identified. Um, it also says in this plan that we have over 52 new facilities in the, this term of council and next term of council that we need to put in. Many of those are replacements and repairs, and that's just on our parkland. When we add in our recreation facilities, which includes things like pools, which includes things like community centers, we're getting close to 100 different facilities that we are talking about building or repairing in this, not even the next 10 years, in the next seven years. I really, really am concerned about equity as we talk about this, because we know certain investments have a different payback period, and regardless of where we live in this city, we should be guiding our investment around what is the best way to get the most recreation facilities, the most bang for a buck long term, and if what we know is repairing a facility, thinking about growth planning in our major parks, I, I struggle with this growth idea, and I'd, I'd like someone to specifically tell me um, what is growth related and why is investing in Gage Park, Bayfront Park, the Dundas Driving Park, San Lawrence Park, some of other citywide facilities, is that not a growth related charge? Because we know no matter where someone lives, they're going to be visiting these jewels that we promote across the city. Through the chair, I'll start. Uh, as as finance works with her colleagues in recreation, uh, we'll review the master plan to get a sense as to the ge geographic areas where those developments are required. And then we do apply our matching principles. If the geographic area coincides where there has been growth or expansion that the parkland dedication fee captures, we, we look to match that reserve against those projects. If there are infill projects uh, or intensification projects and related uh, related needs is we 
Likewise, look to this reserve as a partial funding source, recognizing there are, are uh, benefits to existing. So, so again, based on the master plan, finance sit down with our colleagues in public works and planning economic development, and we put forward a financing strategy that ultimately comes to committee and council for approval. And that is where we demonstrate the, the need and the draw on the reserves. I really appreciate that clarity. And through you, Chair, Deputy Mayor, just the piece I'm struggling with here is in the answer I heard, so the, the way we got this $88 million is when someone put in development fees in a specific area, um, it's noted that, okay, a portion of these fees go to parkland dedication and it's earmarked for that area. What are the areas in our city? Or is that at the ward level? Like, are we doing the old suburban boundaries? Because what, what we've said is essentially we have little catchment areas, and if there was growth within that catchment area, the funding would be used for that catchment area. So I'm just wondering what are our, what are our polygons or what are our divisions across the city? Polygon uh, answer? So I'll start, and then I'll invite uh, Acting City Manager Thorne. It, it's not a user fee in that the proceeds go to a specific geographic area. Effectively, we collect fees and we look for projects that are appropriate as to the application of those fees. So we do try to match the reserve as it relates to development-related needs. But it is not, for instance, uh, that 20% that of of the contributions came from a geographic area and therefore 20% of the reserve gets reinvested into that. It, it, the municipality has discretion. And so for instance, what we look to do is match where there is development activity. And as mentioned previously, if that is in a already principally built out area, but there is some infill intensification, we do look to apply this reserve as, as an example. So again, it's used broadly across the whole municipality where there is development activity. Thank you. What I, again, I'm just seeking clarification because I think what I heard was there's actually a lot of breadth and discretion we have as a city, but the way we currently think about how to use that, and that is an internal decision we have made, is to allocate it to areas where we're seeing substantial growth. And I think the, question or the prompt that I'm asking is, is a better lens as we approach this next round as we're doing our parkland master planning, the, sustain, the value for money, the sustainability, thinking not just in year one, year two, but thinking out to the 2050 growth horizon, thinking about the short-term, medium-term, long-term plans that have been identified in our current rec master plan, and not necessarily saying that, because I think we understand we move around a city, we're one city, um, we get around, people go from place A to place B, they're not necessarily just hanging out in their own neighborhood all the time. So if we can define what growth related is, um, I, I guess my recommendation or my hope is that when this comes back, there's some consideration for value for money and not just, you know, there's a lot of growth, there's a lot of activity in this area, let's put a park in that area, that could be the best value for money, but it could also be we have to repair an existing facility, it might be the best value for money. Through the chair, I understand the question, and I would also just remind committee is uh, the work that we're embarking on around asset management, that is the purpose of that work, and the proceeds as it relates to asset management is to address state of good repair. Having said that, as we find often, projects are a combination. There's a combination of state of good repair, there may be an expansion that's tied to growth, and that is the discretion that we exercise is is we, we have to leverage a number of tools. There isn't, well, you know, while someone may turn to this report and assume that there is a, a significant fund that the municipality can go and apply to discretionary, or there are commitments as it relates to, to this fund. So again, short answer is uh, it is one funding source, but we look to other funding sources, including um, our asset management work and the investments that are coming to council as it relates to satisfying state of good repair and asset management. Thank you. My last question is just wondering if we have an understanding of, of the $88.3 million that are in this parkland dedication reserve, how many of them are currently allocated in a budget planning process over the short term, or I've heard like there are some commitments. Sometimes it's allocated, sometimes it's commitment is the language I'm hearing. How much of those funds 
are tied to specific projects already or committed to specific projects and how many of them are currently unallocated? Um, yeah, through the chair, Brian McMullen. Um, yeah, so this particular report shows what um, what has happened in the in the past in the past year. So our budget process and the master plan will show what are where we plan on spending that money, um, where we've allocated or committed that money into the future. Thank you. I just so again, I I know I just know we have so many folks in Ward 13 who are following this conversation and want to follow up on some of this. So I think what I just heard was if folks are interested in that breakdown, they're not going to find it in this report. But if we go back to the 2023 capital budget process, we can look at the Park Van Dedication Reserve and we can see in that budget book where some of those things were allocated. Um, I think that's the question is just if the public wants to find a table of what is allocated, where is this going? It's the 2023 budget book. Um, so, so through the chair, yeah. So, um, likely all of the like we've not likely allocated all of these this reserve in the 2023 budget. We'll be looking to do that um, over the course of the next few months related to the 2024 budget as we develop that. So, I could go back and pull that information for for you just so you know and see what see what's there, what funding was coming from the reserve in the 2023 budget. Um, but then going forward is what we need to where we need to make the commitment um, for this for these funds. Thank you, I really appreciate the uh, chance to deep dive and like these questions. And I think what I'm hearing from colleagues around the table is that, yeah, this is gonna be a hard conversation. It's gonna cut across different wards in different ways, but we're all approaching it as a city. Um, and I think that's a really good way to be thinking about it. So thank you. Thanks very much for those questions. Uh, we have a first time speaker and then we'll go to a second time speaker. First time speaker, Councillor Maureen Wilson. And then after, second time speaker, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. I've been, um, this has been a, a really rich, welcome conversation and uh, fully acknowledging that uh, the future, future conversations may be uh, a little riddled with tension. Um, I, I know Mr. Zagarek has uh, referenced asset management and I'm wondering if he is able to remind me or, or this committee at present, Chair, what is, what do we know about our recreation infrastructure deficit at, at present in terms of our assets? Do you know through the chair? Through the chair, uh, what has come before council to date is you, you may recall asset management is uh, compartmentalized into core assets, non-core assets. To date, it is the core assets, which is principally water, wastewater, storm and transportation. Yes. And council has approved a policy and council approved a multi-year strategy that includes a dedicated 0.6% tax increase starting in 2024. I believe June or July uh, of this year is there's a presentation on the non-core assets, which would include recreation facilities. I believe the deadline for municipalities in developing that policy is July of 2024, uh, I believe. So that is uh, within that second bucket of assets that uh, municipalities will have to approve a policy on. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, a lot of the questions have been asked. I just a comment for me, if I, if I may, Chair. Um, I think it, it's uh, on the, in the discussion forward, there's a lot of uh, values and principles that I've heard articulated this morning, um, climate resiliency, um, equity, uh, child, healthy childhood development um, and I, just personally I <laughs> I don't think it's appropriate uh, for those neighborhoods which are uh, bearing the gifts and sometimes the grind of density uh, to be asking them to rely on area rating money uh, to acquire uh, what so many other wards enjoy, and that is green space. They're bearing the density, they're bearing the congestion, they're bearing um, a paucity of uh, green space, trees. Um, they're also home to some of the uh, tensions that are uh, playing out in our neighborhoods in terms of people who are deprived of housing. Um, and then we're asking them to dip into area rating money uh, to try and bank it over a series of years in order to sec secure a couple of square meters for green space. I just, I don't think that's fair um, at all. 
and um, in the conversations that we have going forward, I hope that we will consider um, people's size of their backyards, their access to private pools, um, uh, the number of trees in a, a square hectare um, when we are talking about uh, securing space, when we're talking about using reserves, when we're talking about our investments. Um, so that's just uh, something I'd like to, to add. And I think also thinking about public assets in a different way. Um, in, in Ward 1, we are using area reserves to um, install, and it's not cheap, uh, public washrooms in all four neighbourhoods, universal gender neutral washrooms. Um, I consider those, I wouldn't be using asset, um, I wouldn't be using area rating money to build a road, but we're having to do it on what I consider to be uh, fundamental public infrastructure that we walked away from over 30 years ago and we downloaded onto the private sector so that you need an income in order to get into a washroom in this city. But that's where we are. So um, moving forward, uh, um, those are the lenses which I will be looking at um, uh, these decisions. And I think it's in our collective interest uh, to ensure that we uh, do lead with equity. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Wilson. And now we're on to second time speaker, Councillor Clark, and then I'm just gonna have a few comments at the end as well. Go ahead, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. This has been a very interesting conversation this morning. Can I get some clarification from GM Zagarek? When we do development charges and we go through that development charge review process, uh, the calculations are dealing with capital for the most part, and we do this lens of uh, how much of this development is needing new infrastructure and how much is a benefit to the existing community. I may have paraphrased the language on it. Can you, can you help me with the Proper language there, sorry. Through the chair, uh, having the councillor having chaired previous DC stakeholder exercises and committees, I'm, I'm confident he's familiar with the process and he's described it accurately, is as the city identifies projects that are necessary to facilitate growth, those projects are then um, broken down into benefit to existing residents and benefit to growth. And then further, as it relates to the funding of those projects, what municipalities must net off the cost as it relates to the growth component is there are statutory exemptions. So there are benefits to development because of statutory legislative uh, exemptions, there are council approved discretionary exemptions, and as well, uh, what we've experienced before, if the city were to secure a grant from senior levels of government, that too would have to be shared with the, the development community. We would have to net off a grant against the cost of that project. So yes, uh, under the DC Act, municipalities are required to identify the costs necessary to facilitate growth and then to break down those costs uh, as, as described. And to be clear, Chair, while it's not on this committee's agenda today, all of those exemptions are savings to developers, so it's profit. It increases their profit. Can I juxtapose how we deal with development charges to parkland dedication. So when a new developer is creating a new subdivision, um, Upper Mount Albion, uh, the Lausanne development, there's a large park that the developer is putting in as a part of that secondary plan that we have, have approved. So the parkland dedication, if they're not 
in essence, building those new facilities. And then they provide us money for a future park through Parkland dedication fees. Do I have that accurate? Through the chair, that's correct. Now, do we, our current policy when we're dealing with those parkland dedication fees for future parkland, is there a requirement that the amount of money that is placed into a parkland dedication by a developer for a specific subdivision, is there a requirement that that money be spent in that area? Geographically, through the chair, uh, not geographically in that area, but again matched to development. So, is it not possible? Because I've listened very closely to my colleagues ac across the floor here, around the chamber, across the floor. Sounds like we're in opposition. Um, is it not possible to create a policy? Uh, perhaps it's through the master plan process, perhaps not. But that parkland dedication fees, there's a percentage of dedication that goes to a new urban park in the, the geographical area, and a percentage of that park, parkland dedication goes to um, existing urban areas for future parkland development. Um, it seems to me that we've been missing the second half. We always kind of get the new urban park somewhere in that development, but we're not setting aside, I may be wrong, but we're not setting aside parkland dedication fees for new parks in urban areas with high density or uh, improving parks that exist in those areas. Is that not something that we as a municipality could do that is a little bit different than what the province is requiring us to do. So, so through the chair, that's, that's kind of done, but not just not quite in the way the councillor is describing. So it's not done as a percentage of each dollar or, or, or based on where the development is, a percentage goes to um, local parks versus broader regional parks. Um, it's not done in that manner, um, but why we keep referring to the parks master plan is that's where prioritization of park needs are established. Um, and so, though, and those park need priorities are based on um, both the needs of existing residents and also where growth is occurring. So to use the downtown example, there's a recognition that downtown is a growing area and it does have park needs as a result. Uh, so within the parks master plan, they would identify what kind of the park priorities are within the downtown area. So that prioritization happens at a, at a park master plan level in terms of you know, first, second, third, fourth, fifth priority for, for new parks based on where the growth is occurring. And then those funds are allocated accordingly. So it, it's similar to, I think, what the councillor describing, but it's not quite in the same way where it's a, a predetermined slice of each dollar. Um, the problem with the predetermined slice of each dollar is, you know, there are issues that, you know, creating parkland in, in the downtown core is just more expensive, you know, where land values are higher, park needs are higher. Um, that's an issue that all cities face in terms of the value of the parkland dedication tool to create urban downtown parks. It, it helps, but it's not sufficient, um, just given the, the dynamics of a, of a downtown area. Um, and also the, you know, the, the, the need is, I'll kind of say it's, it, it's lumpy. It's not like there's an annual amount that's needed. It's typically you've got to build up the reserve until you can make a major investment in, in a new park. Um, to, in sort of urban infill situations, that's more typically what you have to do. It's a, frankly a little bit easier in greenfield context because you have a bit more of a predictable pace of development, um, which you don't really have in, a, in the infill context. So parkland dedication fees that may come out of high-density projects that are infill, that those funds are not dedicated to downtown parks in that area? Uh, through the chair, not on a dollar-for-dollar dollar basis. So we, we do, in terms of our revenues, forecast how, many reven how much revenues we would collect from the downtown area. Um, downtown projects do pay a parkland dedication fee as well. It's, it's can't think of any situations where they've given land. It's almost always cash in lieu uh, for infill. Um, but like I said, it's not that there's a def defined percentage that must go to a downtown park. 
um, but downtown parks are part of the uh, the prioritization that happens through the parks master plan. So, Mr. Chair, um, I think we need some work on this. It, it, it strikes me odd that we would have a parkland dedication fee coming out of large towers. I think of some of these 30-story towers. They're not building a park anywhere in that community. They pay a fee. But we don't have reserves set in such a manner that those fees are uh, dedicated to infill parks in the downtown. Um, and similarly, when we're dealing with parkland dedication fees in large um, urban developments, um, we don't seem to have it set up in a manner that would be a benefit to the existing community and a benefit to the future community. I'm nervous that we are going to run out of parkland dedication fee money very quickly. And without putting in place a program where we ensure that this money is put in a, 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 a separate um, aggregated account um, for downtown parklands, for suburban parks, um, I think we're going to continue to see um, the urban core short thrifted and the large urban areas where we are, whether we like it or not, growth is coming. We'll continue to get these new parks as a part of the secondary plan, but we're not doing that downtown. So we do need to do some work there. Thanks, Councillor Clark. And I'll hand the chair to Councillor Huang um, so I can make a few comments. I really want to thank everyone for the robust discussion here. I think there's two things coming out of this discussion I'm hearing is one, um, we're acknowledging that everyone here really deeply cares about ensuring there's green space and parks in their neighborhoods. Like that's an affirmation that I think we're taking for granted, um, but we shouldn't be um, because that's not always the preoccupation of people who take up these positions. So I'm grateful that we all care this much about this and that we're spending this much time talking about it and making sure we understand it. And thanks to Councillor Alex Wilson for making sure we're also making it really clear to the public what we're talking about, where the public can get engaged with this, how we can find, the under find these things, because I think that legibility is, is key to helping the public participate in this process and help inform us about the decisions we make. Two things I want to say is one, I think, yeah, the value for money uh, thing is really important because sometimes what we're going to say is, look, there's this aging asset in uh, Ward 19 and we need to, um, you know, I'm just making up a, a fake ward so that we aren't picking on one specifically, but there's, you know, in mythical Ward 19, there's an aging asset and it might cost us 10 grand to fix the aging asset. Um, and that's an important thing to do also while balancing the priorities of ensuring that we have parks and urban areas, right? So I think that that balancing is really important and we have to figure out how to do both things because parks aren't just about green spaces and trees. They're also about the assets like splash pads, other kinds of things that people expect when they come to a park, right? Um, I said earlier things about fence, a fence around uh, some grass, but that was minimalistic in terms of the expectations I think people have about what a park looks like now the kinds of services you can get from a park. And for many people, that's the only, those are the only services they have. That's it. What's in the park is what they have, period. And so being mindful of that, I wanna leave my comments off with one example to illustrate Councillor Clark's point. Um, Beasley Park. So, you know, this is a park which is uh, attached to a school by a lot line. It's wedged in between two historically busy streets, one a truck route, Cannon Street, east, um, and the other, which needs a road diet, Wilson Street, which is gonna get one and we're making changes. I'm not gonna try and say we're not doing things there, we are doing things there. But it's wedged in between these two places. And so it's already incredibly difficult for kids to get to and from that green space, to and from that school, and the pollution there is off the charts in terms of particulate matter. So one great thing to do there is, well, expand the park. So in 2021, the city purchased a big piece of land to, uh, on the other side of the park, and the goal is to expand it. Well, guess what? People have been doing stuff with cars there for a long time on that land. It's polluted. So now we have to go in there, core sample, have a little conversation about what the contaminants are, figure out how to clean the contaminants up, contaminants up, remediate that land. 
Then we have to enter an agreement with the school board to figure out how that land can be shared and used by everybody in the community, inclu including folks in the school board, uh, effectively. We have to regrade that land. We have to demolish the structures on that land. We have to find places for the people who exist in the land to go already, uh, where they're going to go next. And then we have to sod and maintain that land. That's one example in downtown of, of just how difficult it can be and how the expenses and costs to uh, GM Thorne's comment earlier about how expensive it can be to do this, right? And that plan won't come to fruition till 2026. The conversation started in 2010. 2010, when Bob Rashina was councillor for Ward 2, that conversation started. We will not have a park space there till at least 2025 or 2026. So that's the legacy and issue I really want to highlight as I lead this conversation, because as we collected those parkland dedication dollars for developments in the area in ye olden times at this point, uh, the issue is they're not worth as much anymore in terms of the actual land value today. So you might collect $100,000 of parkland dedication fee money in 2010, and then in 2026, it's not worth as much in terms of what we can acquire in terms of parkland. So our ability to be nimble and treat this urgently is the only way we're going to get anywhere with this as far as I'm concerned. And I'm, I'm really grateful that everyone here sees that urgency and I hope that in the next this term of council we can really accelerate the process to make sure that everyone has the space they need and the space they deserve. Thanks. I'll take the chair back. I forgot that I was chairing for a moment. Um, on that, I'll take the chair back and I see no one else on the speakers list for this item. So we'll move on to 9.4, which is the amendment to the Code of Conduct Policy, which is HUR 23009. Are there any questions on this item? Councillor Huang. Through you, Chair, may I have just a very quick overview of what has changed from old policy to new policy? Just something super fast, if that's okay. So through the chair, Laura Fontana, Executive Director of Human Resources. So Councillor, this is, and, and to uh, members of committee, this is uh, a review of the Code of Conduct, primarily in response to the fraud and waste uh, audit that was conducted some time ago. And it was really, there were a number of recommendations that were really intended to help employees understand the city's um, expectations and employee responsibilities when it came to the code of conduct and the related schedules. And the amendments that, that are, are, have been made and that are included in this report, uh, particularly the schedules, uh, is with respect to administrative changes. So uh, it's less repetitive text, for example. Um, it's, it's condensed length. Um, we've updated titles. Uh, again, an example would be the Auditor General. And we've provided additional reference uh, materials, uh, again, for example, the social media policy. Uh, we've also uh, provided expanded uh, definitions for more common issues uh, of late particularly, so real and perceived conflicts, uh, pecuniary versus non-pecuniary interests, uh, clarification on employees selling um, uh, goods and services to the city, and we've had some examples of that. We've added social uh, significant uh, relationships, again, uh, something of, uh, of concern in, in the more recent past. And then accepting gifts, uh, fees, hospitality. Uh, oftentimes employees have difficulty uh, understanding the difference and when it's not appropriate and when it's in a, in a conflict, uh, particularly as part of their role with the city. Uh, we've started to track and monitor uh, the code of conduct disclosures of real and perceived breaches, uh, and we've also implemented a tracking tool uh, to help identify the trends or issues, uh, and uh, this will help inform um, our communication and ed education strategy going forward. Uh, we're working with our communications uh, partners in bringing forward uh, a strategy that uh, for all employees to understand the changes to the code of conduct uh, and the related schedules, and then again, uh, really to highlight some of the uh, more common questions, uh, the trends that we're seeing, uh, the issues that are more prevalent uh, today and, and so forth. More of an education, uh, again, um, uh, reflective of our, of our times. Uh, it's also an opportunity for us to um, uh, speak to the launching of our education module uh, through the city's uh, uh, learning management system, LMS, my learning connection that we implemented um, last fall. 
And this online training is uh, required by all employees uh, to be completed by the end of this year. And the content, again, is essentially a review of the, co the code of conduct and the uh, related schedules. And we're also incorporating a number of scenarios uh, so people better understand uh, the, the circumstances in which there may be a, a conflict or a perceived conflict. Uh, we're also um, incorporating um, some, some examples that um, involve various departments uh, as well. And we're working with, for example, procurement um, to help illustrate some of the, uh, some of the examples. We're delivering um, in-person training for those individuals that don't have access to the online training. And then, of course, we're also continuing with the uh, ethical leadership uh, for leaders, uh, again, to help them better understand and demonstrate the ethical behaviors in our workplace um, and, and so forth. So the appendix provides a side-by-side -side comparison of, of the, uh, the current and the new uh, language to the code of conduct and the related um, uh, schedules. And I have with me uh, Nancy Koka, our Director of HR Systems and Operations, as well as Catherine Platt, our um, HR uh, policy and uh, planning specialists uh, who have done the majority of the work on, on, the, um, on the code of conduct and related schedules for any, any further questions. Yes, I have several follow-up questions then. Um, thank you for that overview, Edie Fontana. I am in particular very interested in the code of conduct and the conflict of interest, mostly because I find that they are very opaque and many times the employees have a hard time understanding what is within the realm and what is outside of the realm of a code of conduct or conflict of interest. In particular, we are in a new day and age where there are many employees that have side hustles and they also do small businesses or they have entrepreneurship type activities on the side. Um, many come to the city um, with those side hustles or those entrepreneurial activities already in place. And so many have a hard time understanding and navigating how they can go through their own sort of day-to-day um, -day activities and understanding how those may or may not be a conflict of interest. So um, perhaps you can dig a little bit deeper as to how we are training employees to understand what a conflict of interest is, um, helping them understand um, what is within the realm of their, um, what is a conflict of interest, but also how do we train our people leaders on identifying conflict of interest and then essentially coming up with a plan to help mitigate or combat any of those conflicts of interest uh, through you, Chair. So uh, through the Chair, I'll, I'll start and um, and I'm sure uh, uh, Nancy Koka can, can also help and perhaps uh, Catherine who is online. So I, uh, thanks for the question and indeed that is the, the struggle uh, that we face. Uh, it's not so much that employees uh, don't necessarily want to abide by the code of conduct or the conflict of interest. Oftentimes it's a, a, a matter of not understanding what they're doing and how it potentially creates a, a conflict for them uh, as it relates to their role within the organization. And that's why we've incorporated the training and that's why we've, we've incorporated the case studies, the examples, so that um, our employees understand. So if you have a side business, for example, and it is in conflict with what you do at work or potentially uh, in conflict or there's a real or perceived uh, procuratory uh, interest that you need to declare it. And, and we had that training that the employees sign off on the um, disclosure form on a, on a yearly basis, uh, but the training does incorporate uh, many of the examples uh, that, that potentially help employees understand that, uh, that conflict. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Nancy who, who, or, and or Catherine who may have uh, better examples in terms of how we, um, we share that information. Uh, so good morning through the chair, Nancy Koka, Director of HR Systems and Operations. So in addition to Laura's comments around the available training, we also continue to have the annual requirement for employees to sign off on the Code of Conduct, indicating that they acknowledge, they've understood, and they've had an opportunity to review. Uh, we've also introduced a Code of Conduct email address, and that allows employees to forward any questions they have. And a lot of the times, the questions are what leads to the conversations around understanding what their requirements are. We often engage their respective people leaders in those conversations as well. And part of the disclosure form that we ask employees to complete when there is a perceived or real 
conflict is to develop a mitigation plan. And that mitigation plan is intended to outline what are some of the scenarios where an employee you know, may have to disclose, what can we do to protect both the city's interests, the employee's interests, um, to mitigate the level of risk or potentially the level of perceived conflict that may be seen in the public. With respect to people leaders, we do have the ethical leadership program that they are required to abide by, and that provides them an ethical framework that allows them to review scenarios, walk through what the framework provides in terms of when is it a, a perceived conflict, a real conflict, and what are the leaders' responsibilities and accountabilities to identify those conflicts, because sometimes the employees don't know, uh, and they may not know to disclose, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, part of our moving forward communication strategy now that we're able to track those disclosure forms when they come in, we're able to track the types of inquiries or consultations we do uh, with HR. Sometimes we engage legal, we engage procurement when it's appropriate. Now that we're able to track those, we'll be able to see some of the trends that are happening and we'll refocus our communication and our education strategies if it means changing some of the scenarios we have on the code of conduct so that we can address some of the things we typically tend to see over and over again. It's all in an effort to make sure employees understand uh, what their obligations are, when it's time to disclose, and when they can consult and ask questions without concern that you know if they've disclosed something that may be compromising to them. Part of it is just the confidence in knowing um, that we're here to provide them with that support and that disclosure is really to protect them and the city as well. Thanks, and just before you come back to your questioning, I know you used the word people leaders a few times there, and I think this is maybe an opportunity for those listening in, just to define what that language means, what a people leader is in terms of our HR processes at the city of Hamilton, if you don't mind. Sure, through the chair. So uh, people leaders is our sort of generic term when we're talking about anybody that's in a position to provide leadership or direction to our staff. So typically that's supervisor level and up in the organization. Um, and all of them are required to participate in the ethical leadership training as part of their ongoing training through the, co the uh, LMS. Thank you very much. Back to you, Councillor Huang. LMS, Learning Management System. <laughs> Correct, uh. LMS, <laughs> the My Learning Connection. Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Thank you, Director. Um, I'm encouraged and I appreciate hearing that, that we are trying to be adaptable to some of these new situations. What I may have missed is what is the escalation protocol? Should there be a conflict of interest or some sort of, dis not dispute, but perhaps a difference of opinion as to whether there is a conflict of interest, how does this get escalated? Because I find that what I hear from the from the staff level is that there is, if it goes into some sort of mitigation plan, that's the be all and end all. However, there may be other circumstances that are part of this that may not be taken into account and there's no method or methodology to actually escalate this to have other eyes look at this. So is there some sort of escalation protocol here? So through the chair, yes, that's a great question. Um, we had um, somewhat of an informal escalation process previously, but with updating the disclosure form, we've made it very clear that in a case-by-case -case basis, when there may be a dispute where there may be um, um, a different opinion in terms of which mitigation strategies are appropriate, or if a mitigation strategy is even appropriate. In some cases, um, there may be such a significant conflict that there is no mitigation and that there has to be some decisions made uh, with respect to the outcome. But we have begun to engage other areas of the organization when it's appropriate. So in the case of a procurement matter, we uh, consult with procurement. In some cases, we've consulted with legal. Um, we've also, in some cases, uh, uh, consulted with risk. Um, and when there is a dispute and when things begin to escalate, Escalate. There is built into the disclosure form now uh, the opportunity for human resources in consultation with the respective people leaders, might be the director, might be the GM, um, to also provide escalation to the city manager when there is a dispute with respect to some of those cases. But it's an informed decision based on drawing in the right resources, including legal risk, procurement, and anyone else that may have an interest in terms of ensuring to protect the city's interests. Last question then through you, Chair. Um, we're in a talent crunch and we are looking for talent left, right and center. However, much of this talent already has these side hustles already in place. Um, so what are we doing in the recruitment process to help mitigate some of those uh, conflicts of interest before they actually get hired in and then we find out that they have um, these side hustles that could potentially cause a conflict of interest. Is that, I don't know if that violates anything, but it's one of those, um, situations where I've heard time and time again where they've already had something in place previous to their employment here and now that has 
now that in the course of their actual day-to-day -day activities, they have, that has now come out that that is a conflict of interest. So, um, and then what happens is we go through a lengthy process. It's and then at the end of it, we may not be able to keep these employees. Again, this comes back to a talent crunch, and what we're looking for is great talent. But what what are we doing to help with sort of heading that off as some of the challenges there? So through you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, through the Chair, I'll start, and perhaps um, Nancy may have something additional to add and or uh, Catherine. So uh, thanks for the question, Councillor. I mean, we are obviously in a, a talent uh, fight for, uh, for good people. As part of the recruitment process, um, employees have to sign off on a disclosure form, so they'll review it, and hopefully at that point they'll identify potential conflicts. Um, just because someone has a side you know, job or, or business or whatever the case may be, doesn't necessarily mean that they are um, going to be in conflict uh, with their um, position at the city. So we'll work through that. Uh, we also have the nepotism uh, disclosure as part of the recruitment process where uh, the, the potential candidate will disclose uh, uh, any family members or if there's any other potential conflicts as a result of their employment with the city. So the, the, the short answer is we would work with the individuals. If there are issues, we're going to address them. We'll see them in, in whether or not they're, if they're insurmountable, then we, we certainly can't uh, proceed. Uh, but this is not an exercise in, in trying to dissuade uh, or prevent these hires to, uh, happening. It, it, we just need to have that disclosure so that we uh, we know what we're dealing with, and then we put the the proper protocols in place to protect uh, against any potential conflict uh, going forward. So it shouldn't adversely affect the uh, recruitment process. Uh, we just want to have a, a better you know eyes wide open uh, approach, uh, so that um, potential candidates do not put themselves in a uh, in a potential conflict of interest um, as a result of being employed by the city. Thanks, Councillor Huang. Did you have a further question? I have one last question. Go for it. You've got time. <laughs> um, my last question is, um, should this move forward and should we accept this? What is the actual rollout strategy? How are we planning to roll this out to all of our 7,000, 8,000 employees and ensuring that they all understand what are the changes here? Uh, so through the chair, as uh, Laura previously mentioned, HR is working with their communications team to develop a communication strategy to roll out the changes to the code of conduct. Um, we also want to introduce some regular updates to staff, so not just this initial change and then kind of put it to bed. We want to make sure that code of conduct is something that's a forefront as we need to throughout the year. Um, so working on a bit of a strategy to uh, develop a communication plan that may highlight some of those things that we tend to see through the code of conduct email, uh, through some of the questions that we're getting, through some of the disclosures we may be receiving and that way the information is relevant and employees can sort of relate to any of the changes that are happening or those hot topics that then tend to come up or the questions we tend to receive a lot. Uh, we also want to make sure employees are aware of the um, learning content that is on my learning connection. So the code of conduct training that's available to there, making sure that that's accessible to everyone. So with the learning management system, we've been able to improve accessibility to that training, but we've also continued to provide uh, uh, resourcing and support to leaders within the organization to deliver the training when employees don't have access to assets or to devices. So if they have to deliver it in person, uh, we've provided them some content to be able to do that. And then the plan is that we would continue to look at the code of conduct and if an additional refinement is needed to the policies in the schedule. So for finding that language is confusing or that we're often getting questions about uh, particular provisions of either the schedules or the code of conduct, we'll keep looking at that uh, on an annual basis to see if there's any additional tweaks we need to make to the policy so that it continues to be relevant and continues to be easy to understand to staff. Um, and it is always part of our onboarding process with new staff. So part of their um, orientation, uh, one of the first things that we put them through is the code of conduct module on the learning management system so that it's something at the forefront and employees sign off um, as part of their onboarding to the city. Sorry, I do have one more question. Um, when I read the code of conduct, it does have that air of professionalism. So I, I, my question is around tone. And I know that you'll be working with the director of communications and the comms team around this. But um, I wonder if there's an opportunity to take a look at the tone in which we are speaking from. I'm rather than from a bureaucratic or a big city kind of tone, perhaps there is a shift towards 
this is a city that is in service of this community. So perhaps changing the way that we actually um, speak to our employees and trying to push forward that this is a this is a public service that we are here to serve the community rather than that of a large bureaucratic kind of tone. I hope that makes sense. I hope that that's something that we can um, potentially take a look at um, through you, Chair. So through the chair, absolutely. I mean, it's twofold. It's certainly that we provide services to the city, but we also uh, want to have a, a tone that it is uh, to support and, and help protect employees uh, against things that perhaps they're not even aware of. So while we have duties and responsibilities and accountabilities and, and, and uh, things of that sort, and we want to protect the organization, we also have a duty to protect the employees. And oftentimes with you know the changing dynamics in our society, uh, folks don't even know what is a potential um, a conflict. So it is su supportive in that nature, but I, uh, you know, we certainly take your advice and we will look at the tone for our, our communication strategy going forward. Thank you, Councillor Huang. And next up on the speakers, this is Councillor Clark, and then I'm on after Councillor Clark. Go ahead, Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have a, a, a number of questions, and I'll uh, make them very brief so that I can hear a fulsome answer. We have a code of conduct for our employees, and we have a code of conduct for our elected members. Can I ask, are they congruent with each other? Are they the same? Uh, so through the chair, um, Councillor Clark, I believe that was actually a request you'd even had when we had brought the original changes to the conflict of interest. You'd asked us to take a review uh, in collaboration with clerks to see if the two uh, provisions are similar in terms of uh, congruency and consistency. Um, so I believe um, that our um, policy specialist, myself, and uh, our clerk um, are engaging in that conversation just to ensure that those provisions are aligned and there isn't any discrepancy between the two. We can certainly take that away and ensure that that's continued. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because it's important that our employees know that we're not asking anything of them that we don't ask of ourselves. If our employees have a concern about a potential interest, a bias or conflict, who do they call? Uh, through the chair, so there's several options. We do encourage staff to have a discussion with their respective supervisors, managers, or people leaders, and in some cases, they will uh, jointly give uh, HR a call to do a consultation, walk through the scenario. Uh, we have a code of conduct email address that is regularly monitored so that those requests and uh, inquiries can come in and we can provide a response. Um, we do do a significant amount of consultations with staff when they have questions because sometimes they don't know and they want to walk through a scenario before uh, they take any uh, steps. So through our communication strategy, through the training, um, and through the sign-off, we do share the code of conduct email address regularly to ensure that employees have a venue to bring those questions through. And in some cases, we've also had inquiries that have come through the fraud and waste hotline as well, because sometimes employees will choose different avenues to bring forward their inquiries. Yeah, I can understand that, because they don't want any retaliation or potential retaliation. Um, but there isn't a single person that they reach out to. It's, it's a department. Through the chair, so currently the code of conduct email address is monitored by Catherine Platt, who is our policy and planning specialist, uh, and she will often draw in the appropriate consultations as needed. So that first point of contact is generally through Catherine, just because she's the one that monitors the email address. Um, however, she will draw in the appropriate person uh, in terms of any consultation that's needed. So do we provide our employees a memorandum of advice with respect to how to handle the potential bias, interest, or conflict? Uh, through the chair, I'm going to try to answer that question. I may need some clarification. So, um, if they are searching for questions or inquiries or wanting to understand what mitigation is put into place in order to address 
the conflict, then uh, certainly that's done through the consultation and through documenting the mitigation strategy in the disclosure form. Um, if they are looking for direction or advice or have concerns regarding any bias associated with that mitigation or any bias associated with the consultation or where the decision may land, uh, then through that escalation process I discussed previously, we would then engage uh, potentially legal risk audit in some cases um, to, to determine the appropriate response. I hope that answers your question. If not, I might need some clarification. When an integrity commissioner provides advice to a counselor, it is locked down. If there's any trouble down the road, the advice provided the counselor has followed that advice, uh, they won't be in trouble. Do we provide a similar opportunity for our employees? Through the chair, I'll, I'll start. I, I would suggest, counselor, that it depends on the circumstances. Uh, if if the uh, the matter is egregious, um, you know we often uh, times can also consult with uh, labor relations. If it's a fraud, for example, depending on on uh, on the particulars uh, of the uh, of the matter. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we would be uh, more supportive in nature in providing uh, our employees with educations and the tools and supports to better understand, and in particular in those cases where uh, there is no um, direct intention, um, there may be circumstances that uh, have lended themselves to, to a, a situation uh, beyond someone's control or, or certainly not within their, their realm of uh, consideration. But if it is egregious and it's intentional and, and an employee ought to have known, uh, then we do uh, refer the matter to labor relations, uh, which will consider uh, the issue and the employee and the circumstances, and then make a recommendation for any disciplinary action uh, as appropriate. Yeah, I, and I understand that, um, E.D. Fontana. I guess what I'm trying to understand is, is an employee comes to HR for advice about a potential bias, interest, or conflict, prior to that bias, interest, or conflict at being acted upon, do we provide advice that protects them from any future HR issues if they follow that advice? So through the chair, uh, thank you for the clarification, Councillor. Absolutely. Uh, we would... Uh we would have the conversations, provide them with the uh, the information, the supports, and we certainly don't want to have employees view uh, human resources as uh, a potential trap in, in terms of them uh, consulting with us and then making themselves vulnerable um, with uh, with issues going forward. There may be circumstances where we have no choice but to re react or respond to whatever is being um, uh, uh, declared, but we do protect the anonymity and the confidentiality of our employees uh, to the, to the uh, extent uh, possible, and that is a priority for us. Our, our reputation is built on our ability to protect the uh, an anonymity and confidentiality of our employees. Thank you. Just uh, three quick more questions, if I have time, Mr. Chairman. When I read the 56-page Appendix A, I believe I understand that we have created a prohibition for any employee and their family business or their own business doing business with the municipality. Is, is that an accurate read of what that policy is? So through the chair, I'll start, and perhaps um, uh, again, um, uh, Nancy Koka or Catherine Platt can uh, can add to it. In fact, we brought a policy uh, amendment uh, to council. Um, I think a month or two ago, where it does prohibit employees uh, from bidding on on uh, on jobs or, or contracts uh, in 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 situations where they are um, they have their own their own business, save and accept uh, situations where it is in the city's best interest for that employee to uh, to bid on the contract if there's no other alternative uh, but to have the individual uh, bid on the, on the contract. But all things being equal, they, they are generally prohibited from, from bidding on such contracts where they have their own business. Uh, thank you for, for uh, clarification. 
if an employee is working in the roads department and a family member owns a business and bids on business with the city of Hamilton, unless that employee is in a managerial role and has any ability to make that decision on that bid, that's not a bias for that employee, is it? They have no role in making that decision. They're just the fellow that's out there patching our potholes. Uh, so through the chair, I'll, I'll try to answer that question. Um, there are a variety of scenarios where we've uh, consulted in, with respect to family members uh, bidding on um, projects or work uh, associated with the city. And in most cases, we look at things such as, uh, is the employee involved in the procurement process? If there is an RFP, a competitive process, do they have decision making? Um, we even go so far in some circumstances to, to determine if the employee is involved in the requirements or scope of work associated with the bid. So if they have proprietary knowledge uh, that we are concerned, the perception may be that they have information that could be shared with family members, not suggesting that they would, but there is a perceived uh, potential conflict. We also look at those scenarios and develop some mitigation strategies to ensure that the employee is protected uh, with respect to the information they have um, access to or they uh, are proprietary to. We also, um, in some cases, will ask questions when the employee disclosed to determine if even though the employee, uh, it's their family business, does the employee have any family financial interest or pecuniary interest outside of the organization relative to that business? So although they are a city employee, um, they may have, depending on the family situation and relationship, um, financial interests on that family member bidding on a particular contract. So we look at a variety of factors um, and if appropriate, develop an appropriate mitigation strategy. Uh, and if a mitigation strategy does not protect either the employee or the city, um, then we do ask the employee to recuse themselves and if possible, remove themselves from the process entirely. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Chair. I heard the word nepotism uh, twice in the presentation this morning. Uh, specifically in regard to family members being hired. Are we referencing nepotism as in the manager or decision maker with regards to the hire uh, cannot hire family? Uh, through the chair, uh, with respect to nepotism, it's both from a hiring or decision-making um, perspective with respect to the recruitment process, but also with respect to the reporting relationship when the employee is hired. Yes, that's excellent. Um, but we encourage Hamilton, City of Hamilton family having their brothers, sisters, sons, daughters employed by the city just because... Um, they're employed by the city does not negate their brothers, sisters, sons, daughters from applying for work with the city. So through the chair, um, it, it, it wouldn't negate um, um, that, that scenario, but we, we would ensure that there is no direct or indirect reporting relationship between the family members or someone even having a social um, a significant relationship with that individual. And no in interve intervention by the employee trying to get their son's daughter hired. Uh, again, that seems to be a, a natural uh, response now with the city. The last question I have, Mr. Chairman, is the cap on gifts at $25. I, I don't, and I didn't review the, the council one, but I think that's different than the code of conduct for council. Through the chair, um, I'm, I'm gonna start and I think Catherine might be um, better able to answer this question. I think it's up to $100, uh, between 25 and $100 in terms of the, the, the value, but you have to uh, disclose once it reaches a minimum of $25. We'll look to um, another member of staff to, to answer. Is that sufficient, Councillor Clark? Did you want to get the answer from the other member of staff? Um, no, that's sufficient. My okay. ancillary question would be, have we contemplated 
a flat out prohibition on all gifts to our employees and, and, and likewise to uh, city councillors. And the reason I ask is if we have a 25 cap or 25 to 100 and an employee is being, I would use the colloquial term schmoozed <laughs> by uh, business leaders and, and, and people who are running their own business. It, it is a well-known practice in the business community to take uh, business associates or uh, clients out to dinner to continually ensure that they're thinking of that business when they're making their next decision. It can work in the opposite, where if a government is permitted to do this, then developers and business people will take those decision makers out to fancy meals in the hopes that developing a friendly relationship with that business decider. I think the only way to stop that type of bias or unintended bias is to prohibit gifts to our employees and, our, and, and the elected members. Have we contemplated that? And have other municipalities gone in that direction? Thanks, Councillor Clark, that's your time. Go ahead. Through the chair, so that's a really great question. Um, this initial change to the code of conduct was really intended to address some of the recommendations through audit, and they were really around clarity, um, brevity, ensuring the proper definitions were in place, updating the language. One of the next things that we are going to look at with respect to the code of conduct and the associated schedules is a more fulsome review of some of the provisions, including a better environmental scan of what other municipalities are doing. This particular uh, schedule with respect to hospitality and gifts is one of the ones that we are going to be looking at in terms of are we setting the appropriate limits? Um, are those provisions in accordance with similar municipalities and other public sector organizations? Are those dollar values required, needed? Do we need to have more stringent requirements with respect to that? Um, I can tell you one of our um, policy review processes that we do within the cities, we have a dedicated policy review group made up of representatives from each of the respective operating departments at the director level. Uh, this was one of those areas that came up and, and um, one of the things that um, was, was asked to be looked at in the next review of the Code of Conduct. So um, I, I think, uh, Councillor, uh, in regards to some of your comments, this is one of these opportunities where we have the opportunity to look at this uh, particular language and tighten it up a little bit um, just to ensure it's more consistent with uh, both Council's expectations and our ability as a public sector to ensure we're protecting um, you know, our employees and, and aligning it better to what some of the other provisions and other municipalities are doing relative to gifts and hospitality. Uh, thank you for that response, Mr. Chairman. If you can put me down for a second time for quick comments, I'd appreciate it. Since it's only you and I on the speaker's list now, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> I appreciate you yielding that, that to me. Um, I think the changes in this document are excellent. It is a document that has evolved over time. I think there has been an attempt in taking the language away from what I would deem legalese and language that we are most comfortable with in a government setting uh, to ensuring that it is simple language, practical language, so that our employees can truly understand the intention of the policy and how to comply with the policy. All of that is, is very positive. Ideally, Mr. Chairman, I would like to see a review of both the council code of conduct and the employee code of conduct to ensure that they are congruent. We should not be asking our employees uh, less or more than we are asking ourselves. And I find that if there is a difference in expectations to an elected member's code of conduct and an employee uh, code of conduct that it causes confusion. And so uh, the uh, more congruent they are, the better. 
I would like to see a review on the cap of get our gifts, and I'm not sure if we need to formalize that with direction, a motion today. Here's the reason why, Mr. Chair. When I worked in government relations and worked with numerous business leaders in our community, it was the go-to if there was an issue with any level of government by taking an employee out to dinner or lunch. I have seen um, uh, rather expensive dinners provided to decision makers or people within government who may have an opportunity to sway a decision down the road. These business leaders do not spend money frivolously. So if they're spending money on meals and dinners and golf games, they're doing it because they know over time it creates an unintended bias of friendship between them and the business. And so they're doing it with very clear direction. It's to their benefit over time because you're not going to forget the ABC company if they're taking you out to dinner or taking you out to breakfast every month. Um, I think it's important that from that perspective we look at a review on the cap on gifts and just say, no, there, we do not allow gifts to our employees and we do not allow gifts to our counselors. And if you did that, there would be no confusion. The, ex the exemption of, of uh, attending a charitable event, we have to be careful with that because some charitable events are very expensive and the bias is still there. If you're going to a $250 golf tournament free because it's a charitable event, that's a significant gift. And so under the auspices of charity, all of a sudden it becomes, so if an elected member or a staff member has been invited to an event to speak at, I think that's fair game that if there's that token, here's the mug uh, from the Rotary Club, that type of thing, I don't think that social convention is an issue. Um, but I do think it's important that we ask our staff to do a review of municipalities, uh, of how do they, they have handled this, and really have deliberate consideration of a prohibition of gifts to employees and elected members. Thank you. Sounds like a motion. Somebody want to second that? Councillor Maureen Wilson. So the motion, if I understand it, and I'll just be giving some time to L.C. Bates to get it, is that we staff report back on um, a policy, um, the implications of a policy to look at uh, employee and council gifts, or to limit those gifts, to not mm -hmm. having those gifts. Yep. I'll just keep saying things, but I'm sure Elsie Bates is much better than I am. And if you have some language that you can put on the screen, that'd be wonderful. And if you don't, I'll let you say something. If you bear with me for one moment while I type um, something up really quickly. No problem at all. These will be the bearing moments, everyone. In the meanwhile, um, during the bearing moments, Councillor Maureen Wilson. Thank you, just on this subject, um, if I could ask through the chair to E.D. Fontana, what is the rationale for allowing um, the acceptance of gifts of any kind? E.D. Fontana? Uh, through the, the chair. 
Allowing for what I'll call a nominal amount of gifts, so, you know, approximately $25, maximum $100. Oftentimes, depending on the role of an employee in an organization, they find themselves in a situation where they are uh, subject to receiving these sorts of gifts, and it, it can be um, a, a compromising uh, situation. Uh, it can be a potentially um, problematic for them, and it's it's it, it also is a bit um, they're in a in a vulnerable position where you know accepting no gifts uh, may be something that um, is is potentially problematic for them. So something nominal, um, my experience has always been in, in that range, well, 25 and, and more currently up to a $100 range. But it just allows for that discretion so that employees are not in an awkward uh, situation where it's a, a general... Um, a general happening where they are receive these types of gifts, you know, as as part of their um, experiences, um, as part of their work um, involvements or interactions with, with others. Uh, so having that nominal amount uh, uh, provides for them that that discretion, so or that they can accept um, something more nominal, and it's not considered uh, to be that inappropriate, or that they are they are profiting or in a position where it's it's um, you know excessive. Providing that nominal amount uh, allows for them to to accept something that is is in all you know in all accounts uh, um, not inappropriate. Councillor Wilson. So I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of capital on this, or time rather, but I, I am trying to understand. And I, and I know this sounds holier than thou. I don't accept any gifts. I, I, I don't enable anyone to buy me a cup of coffee. Um, and are, are you um, talking about, say, a professional association if someone was speaking and um, in exchange for... Uh, a payment, they're awarded, say, a, a sketch or something like that. Is that what you mean by awkwardness through the chair? Uh, so through, through the chair, I, I think that is a very good example uh, where you do um, you know, present and uh, they, they'll offer you a nominal uh, gift and it, it does remove that awkwardness. You also go to conferences and they provide you with the mug or they provide you with a um, you know, a, a book cover or, or something. It just removes, um, you know, it, it protects the employee in that it doesn't potentially compromise them uh, if they do accept it. Um, and, and, and in those circumstances, it may be difficult for them not to accept it. So uh, it just provides that, you know, level, I'll, I'll call it a, a minimum, you know, amount of buffer uh, to help protect employees and accepting those nominal gifts uh, remove that awkwardness, and it's um, it, it, it's it's part of our day-to-day -day, uh, interactions, and it's it's very very common. You can go to a conference now, and there's always something uh, that they're they're even providing you for being an attendee. So uh, it eliminates that uh, that potential for employees to be in a situation where they are in a breach, uh, and it's also nominal enough that it, it's not significant uh, to be uh, problematic for them. Thank you. Thanks, and we're on the motion now, so we're taking comments on the motion, moved by Councillor Clark and seconded by Councillor Wilson, and we'll have the text up eventually, but we're still taking comments on that right now, and I recognize Councillor Huang on that, and then I'm also on the list. Thank you. I think I'm, um, I'm a little conflicted on this one, too, because coming from an economic development background, we were routinely connecting with foreign dignitaries and different groups that were looking at... Um, building a relationship here in Hamilton where gift giving is a really big part of the culture. I think about the Chinese culture where that is a huge part where you always bring a gift to whoever you're visiting um, and as well the expectation of different cultural groups is to have that exchange of gifts in order to build those relationships. So I'm really conflicted about this no gift giving, so I'm a little bit hesitant to put my name towards something like this, where it will severely hinder how we as counselors who are in the community building relationships, but then two, for our staff who are in the business of actually building relationships internationally. And again, this is a very big part of that culture where I hesitate to remove that entirely from the equation. So those are my comments. 
Thank you. And if you could take the chair, Councillor Huang. Oh, I see Councillor Alex Wilson. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, supportive of the motion, it's a request for a report back. I think we can find that nuance and that balance through more information. Like it doesn't, I don't think we'll come to a decision today. And so getting a report back on how we could narrow it, maybe there's some folks in the room who are saying, what about situation A, situation B, great. When we get that report back about narrowing, maybe there's an exception in there for this situation. I really support the general direction we're moving in about getting narrower, um, potentially all the way to zero. Um, that sounds great. Um, the only reason I'm jumping on the speakers list to say this is I may not be able to stick around for the vote, so just wanted to put that on the public record. Thank you, uh, Councillor Alex Wilson. Um, take the chair if you don't mind, Councillor Huang. So I just want to briefly also add to this discussion, um, again, not also trying to, to preach here, but I don't accept any gifts, period. And I know it's awkward. And I've had a lot of awkward conversations, actually, and actually some very difficult conversations with some people who really want to do this. There's nothing wrong with accepting a gift on behalf of the city of Hamilton. It's when we are the ones who receive the benefit of the gift that I have a problem with. I don't care what the situation might be. Yes, I think exceptionality is important in every situation where there's rules to acknowledge the fact that it's not going to apply broadly across every situation. But there simply are going to be awkward situations when you're having professional relationships. And I think creating a boundary and creating a border and creating that professional, professional barrier between yourself and those who have interests with, for the city is, a, is super important. And I think 100 bucks is way too much money because it does allow for, as Councillor Clark said, a lot of this like dinner having and dinner giving and all these other kinds of things. Um, and also there's an iteration here we're not talking about. What's a gift? What's it tied to time-wise? So if I give you a gift on Tuesday, can I give you a gift on Tuesday morning? Another one Tuesday afternoon? What about Wednesday? What about Friday? What about next month? And then suddenly now we're in a situation where an individual can say, well, those were all separate gifts. And we're talking about thousands of dollars that have been given out in dinners over the course of a year or golf tournaments or whatever you want to call them. This is how you buy influence as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it's why I don't accept gifts because I don't want to set a precedent of any kind to make anyone think. It's why I didn't take money from developers when I ran for election because I do not want to set a precedent that anyone coming here to make a major decision so I could, I could know in advance they're going to make. Um, or reasonably deduce they might make, uh, could be trying to perceptively influence what I'm doing. And everyone's allowed to make their own choices with respect to that, specifically. But once we get here as councillors, um, I think we really have to hold ourselves accountable to that and not accept gifts of any kind. And if it's awkward for us to say no, then we have to learn to train ourselves, I think. And if we need training on that, get it. Because um, saying no sometimes is part of our professional obligation, it's part of our political obligation, uh, and it's part of everyone in a position of authority here, every people leader in this organization, to do that. Um, and I think that's just got to be a line in the sand, that we, that we start moving forward as we professionalize our organization, that this becomes a cornerstone of what we do here. Um, this is a huge city. And um, there are major decisions worth multi-millions of dollars on the line every single day. And we may not, as staff, or staff may not even know the relationship that they have to the decision-making process that's, that's taking place, right? That person may think that they're involved in. And so removing that completely and saying, and saying having a policy means saying, sorry, um, can't do this city policy, or I'm happy to accept this gift on the behalf of the city of Hamilton, and then turning it over to like the gifts people, <laughs> you know, whoever those people are, um, for them to do something with the gifts. And if that means we retain some gifts because they're ceremonial in nature or important in nature, great. And some gifts we may not retain and we may uh, find a way to, to, to dispose of those in a charitable way, right, um, to give those to others. So the benefit can be passed back to the community. Whatever this policy looks like, I really think it's time for it, so very happy for, happy for this motion, um, just, to, just to do whatever we can to to increase our ethical boundaries and bring it up and, and raise them so that we're, um, you know, not having to frankly uh, stumble over ourselves. We can refer to it as something by saying, here, here's a policy. Oh, would you like a copy? No problem, here it is, right? So it makes it easier for everyone to have those conversations. I will take the chair back, see Councillor Tattison, and then a second time speaker in Councillor Clark, and then a second time speaker in Councillor Wilson, uh, Maureen Wilson. Councillor Tattison? Chair, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm more of the line along the lines of with this issue along the lines of uh, Councillor Wang's opinion. I know the difference. 
I go to a school and the principal presents me in front of a class with a, with a school mug to put in my office. There's a difference there. So, so I can accept that. Someone offers to buy me lunch because they want to sit down. I'm not taking that. Someone comes into my office and wants to speak to me about issues regarding a development or something. I do take that meeting but I don't accept any gifts. So for me, I, I do want some discretion. I think I know the difference between when someone's trying to, again, influence me in a sense, but I, but I think that objectivity is important and, and rightly so. I, I understand. I took no fees whatsoever from anyone because I wanted not to have any undue influence in the decisions that I'm going to make during the election campaign. Because if I was elected and I was going forward, I wanted to be in no one's back pocket for what, for anything. So for me, I'm, I'm okay with um, a little bit of discretion and uh, the way it stands. And I would prefer to wait for a report that's, that narrows it as Councillor Wilson says down to something, but I'm not at zero. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chatterson, and second time speaker, Councillor Clark, followed by second time speaker, Councillor Maureen Wilson. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. Do we have the motion? Can you please put it up on the screen, Chair? Yep, motion's going to come up on the screen now, everyone. And there it is. I'll read it out that staff be directed to conduct a review of the codes of conduct for employees and elected officials at other municipalities and report back to the Audit Finance and Administration Committee with recommendations respecting, limiting, or prohibiting the accepting of gifts for employees and elected officials. Councillor Clark. Um, as usual, the, the clerk does an excellent job of taking my discussion and narrowing it down to a precise motion, so thank you for that. Um, we can create a policy that enables social conventions by narrowing the definition of what a social convention is. Getting a mug at a school after speaking to a class is not an attempt at changing an elected member's decision on anything. Being taken to the Edgewater for a $100 meal, that's an attempt at changing a counselor's decision or an employee's decision. We need to be concise. The challenge I have with what is before us is it leaves the door open for business leaders to continue what they have done for thousands of years where they build friendships with decision makers in the hopes that when a future decision is made, they will remember them. Otherwise, there would be no point to taking employees or counselors out to a fancy dinner or on a golf course. I have heard many times in my life, we do business on the golf course. So then, logically, that's why people are inviting decision makers out to play golf. So we have to have clear, concise language that enables our employees and elected officials to say to anyone, be happy to have you at my office, I'll provide the coffee, but no, I can't go out to dinner with you, city policy. I can't accept your Christmas gift, city policy. Having that concise language in our back pocket enables us to make it very clear to anyone and it erases any discomfort in making those statements. It, it's a simple thing to do. So I uh, will continue to support this motion. I look forward to the report back and human re resources can, can, in the recommendations, look at um, social conventions uh, to appease the concerns of, of my colleagues around the table. Um, that was never my intention to prohibit social conventions, um, but going out to dinner, breakfast, uh, and it's not a, a chamber of commerce or something like that, 
or a, a charitable group that wants to sit down and talk to you and they take you out for coffee, that's not the issue. And we all know that. And so it's, it's an attempt at creating a very clear line to ensure that our employees and counselors are never placed in an unintended bias upon themselves on any decision. Thank you. Before we turn to Councillor Maureen Wilson, I just wanted to read the changes to the motion. I know that the legislative coordinator was conferring with staff, and so I'm just going to read with parts A and part B. Again, just folks who are watching along and may benefit from hearing it since it's on the fly. A, that human resources staff be directed to conduct a review of the codes of conduct for employees and at other municipalities and report back to the Audit, Finance, and Administration Committee with recommendations respecting limiting or prohibiting the accepting of gifts for employees. And that B, that clerk staff be directed to conduct a review of the codes of conduct for elected officials at other municipalities and report back to AFNA, uh, that's Audit, Finance, and Administration, with recommendations respecting limiting or prohibiting the accepting of gifts for elected officials. So what we've done here is we've just separated the work out. So that we're ensuring that um, the work with respect to human resources and our staff is done by one body and the work with respect to council is done by another body as it has traditionally been done and separated in those two ways doesn't change the language just really clarifies the work thank you for that and to you councillor maureen wilson a little bit of levity um there i, <laughs> I was saying i didn't accept uh, i don't uh, accept those christmas baskets that come and uh um, everything else, and then I looked down, I thought, oh, I accepted this shirt this morning. <laughs> so before someone calls me on it. But I, I did it in the interest of public health because my colleague beside me this morning said, you brought a change of shirt, right? Because I'm sitting beside you all morning. And I went, oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> so, but this is from the city of Hamilton, but full disclosure, I there, I, there you go, policy. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Appreciate that, and I see Councillor Tattison uh, poetically snapping along with the spirit of that, and I want to recognize that many of us share that. Uh, so we're going to have the motion voted on now, um, and I see no further speakers on this, so we'll take the electronic vote. Bear with me for one moment, um, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I've been advised that uh, as much as clerks uh, assists with the preparation of the code of conduct for elected officials that is the integrity commissioner that actually does that work. So I'm going to change this to from clerk staff to that the integrity commissioner be directed to do that uh, consult. Um, I'm just looking to, um, to staff. I know Janet's on the call as well. Thank you. That makes sense. So through the chair, I, I would um, I would suggest wording to the effect that the, the city clerk uh, coordinates uh, the work through the integrity commissioner right yes of course okay great so now we all understand that's what we're voting on and we'll have the electronic vote when uh the lc has got it up i appreciate everyone's patience these motions on the fly sometimes are really important because there's a context that gets revealed in the discussion that we weren't available to sort of having in advance and so grateful for everyone's patience councillor clark just before we vote go ahead uh, yeah, I just wanted to, again, thank our staff for this comprehensive look at these codes of conducts. I have written them. It is a lot of work, very arduous, um, and they have done an excellent job, so thank you very much. And on that, the vote is up. Councillor Tattison, are you in favour? Councillor Chatterton is in favor. Two thumbs up. Excellent. Yep. Thank you. And that vote carries seven to zero. And so we'll go back to the speakers. This is the last one on the speakers list for the original um, discussion on the consent item. I want to add a little flavor to the discussion in terms of language. And so I really think what this has demonstrated is something I've been trying to thematically weave through my public comments since I got elected. Language matters. And we can talk all we want about um, how we perceive something, how we're going to do something, how it's going to be enabled. But when we wanted to change the policy, we want to change the culture here, we wrote it down. And I know it's a really obvious point to make, but that's how everything gets done here. We do everything uh, with our staff who are unionized through a collective agreement. We have written policies that 
foreground the decisions we make. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that that work, a lot of the work we do is about writing, is about making sure that we put that language on a piece of paper. And I also say that because um, the legibility of that language and how clear it is was really improved in this round in this round of revision. So I looked at some things like, a great example would be, instead of having the word regular to describe a job or a position, we changed that word to permanent. Very small nuance for most people, hugely important in a human resources context to ensure we update that. So by having these discussions, we're enabling our staff to have a second look at things and say, hey, how can we make this language clearer? How can we make it more accessible? How can we ensure our staff understand what it means? Um, because we may be used to, to writing in a certain bureaucratic language. And so I want to just kind of keep encouraging everybody at the city, colleagues included, to focus on how we can bring people into these conversations, how we can be clear and accessible in the way we write. And I'm very thankful to the, to the staff, and I'm going to use this opportunity to pitch this. Super thankful that the staff have done through the My Learning Collection connection, and thanks to Manager um, Coca and um, Edie Fontana for this. There's a clear writing language course now that's being offered by the city through our Learning Collect Connection um, that all counselors can access, all staff can access, just to help us to ensure that we're using language that's accessible to people, that we're writing in a style that's clear, that we're doing things like, simple things like taking a page-long document that may be dense and doing things like adding bullet points to that document so that it makes it easier for people to read. I audited this course years ago, and so have a, have a good understanding. I used to be a tutor, and I'm a certified tutor, so I understand the fundamentals here. But if we get those out across the organization, we increase legibility, we increase ability of people to do um, the stuff that's in our policies and to adhere to them. And then suddenly that enforcement mechanism, right, is less required. And I'm sure all of us have talked about enforcement. Even here, design matters, right? We talk about road design on the truck route. Enforcement can't get us there, design matters. It's the same in language. If we have an amazingly designed thing, a thing that's super clear from the get-go and the foundation is great, then enforcement is less of an issue. And then our staff can focus on and continue to improve that, those processes rather than chasing people around, explaining to them how it works. There's 140 spots, I think, available for those courses. I encourage every member of council to sign up, their staff. We're doing it at our office and members of senior leadership to sign up for those courses. I think it's only gonna make the organization better. Thanks for your time. Take the share back and we'll move on to the approval of these consent items, 9.2 through 9.4. The receipt, pardon me, of them. Because we're only receiving them because they are consent items. And that motion will be up Just shortly. Confirming that this was moved and seconded by Councillor Huang and Councillor Spadafora, who are indeed still in the room. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for that. And that motion carries seven zero, so we have successfully received those items. And now we're on to item 14. And so we have a private and confidential item, which is just closed session minutes from May 18th, and we can approve those in open session. May I have a mover and a seconder to approve those closed meeting minutes? I see Councillor Spadafora, seconded by Councillor Tattison. Any discussion on the approval of those closed session minutes in general? Not seeing any. Please indicate your vote now. Councillor Clark's in favor. Councillor Chattison's in favor. Okay, that's everybody in favor. On to general information or other business in item 13. Are there any items of general information or other business? Not seeing any. Okay, there aren't any. So, without further ado, we're moving to adjourn and Councillor Spadafora is ahead of me verbally and then Councillor Tattison second off the mark in this horse race. So adjournment is moved by Councillor Spadafora, seconded by Councillor Tattison as we approach the finish line to vote. <laughs> Councillor Clark is in favor of adjourning. And the adjourning has happened, it's carried. 7-0. See you again next time for the Audit Finance Administration Committee. Have a great day.